Are we on now? I think we're waiting for uh, Koba. Oh. Dear judges, we are facing some technical issues. Dr. Sri will be joining us soon. Dr. Sri, are you here with us? Yes. Ah, finally you got it there. Yeah. But to learn to press the right buttons. I say you must get somebody not from the Pataling Street. Lah. Yeah. Can't find any. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a uh, good session now? Yes. <laughs> For posterity. <laughs> hey, bailiff, are we ready? To go? Are we good to go? Uh, yeah, we yeah. are. Judges, uh, before we proceed, we would like to confirm whether um, all the judges have the following documents with you. First, the mood problem. Second, the supplement to the mood problem. Yeah. Third, the rules and regulations. Fourth, both teams' memorials. And lastly, both teams' score sheets. Yep. All right. Are all the judges ready to proceed now? Yeah. Yes. All right. The federal court is now in session. The case before the court involves matters concerning the constitutionality of Section 16 of the Sharia Criminal Offences Selango Enactment 1994. SCOE and Section 7, Subsection 1 of the Printing Presses and Publications Act 1984, PPPA respectively, and the jurisdiction of the Sharia Court. The parties are Samira Binti Sulaiman and another for the appellant, and the Selango State Government and others for the respondent. Councils for the appellant and councils for the respondent are each allocated 45 minutes to present their respective cases. All right, counsel for the appellant. First counsel, are you ready? My lords. Yes. I confirm that I'm audible and visible to the court. Yes, you are. <laughs> Much obliged. My lord, may it please this honorable court. My name is Dan Jun Yu and I appear on behalf of Samira Binti Sulaiman and Samira Publishing Sandidan Perhat, SPSP. Together with me today is my core counsel, Sakina Siraj. On behalf of the respondents, uh, Ms. Emilia Lai and Ms. Xing Yi. My lords, the present case concerns two applications of judicial review, which are heard together by this court today. If I may refer this honorable court to facts of the case. We are familiar nine. with the facts. We are familiar with the facts. Get on with the argument. Yes, my lord. According to page nine, paragraph 15, 14 of the facts, there are four issues that are to be dealt with by this honorable court today. 14.1, 2, 3, and 4. I will be dealing with 14.1 and 2 in the span of 21 minutes, while my co-counsel will be dealing with 14.3 and 4 in the span of another 21 minutes. We reserve three minutes for the rebuttal. My lords, 
The present case concerns the publication of the book titled Gay is Okay, an Islamic Perspective. By I have SPSC. a question for you. You see, in your argument, you are saying that a company is not a person who can profess a religion. One of your arguments. Am I correct? Indeed, my lord. That's our submission. That is your, yeah, that is your submission. And it will be part of your argument or your learned friends? That will be argument. part of my learned friends' your argument. Your learned friends' argument. All right. Never mind. All right. Carry on. My lord, without further ado, I now turn to the first issue, which is whether Section 16 of the Shara Criminal Offences Selangor Enactment 1995, SCOE, is unconstitutional. The appellants submit that it is unconstitutional as the Selangor State Legislature has no power to make the law. We have two grounds to submit. First, Section 16 of SCOE falls within the purview of the item of criminal law in the Federalist. Second, consequently, the State Legislature has no power to enact laws based on the items in the Federalist. But if it is got to do with religion, precepts of Islam, and not to, to do with criminal law, they can enact, correct? That is correct, my lord. And your learned friends in their uh, arguments have said that the word, the phrase precepts of Islam should be construed widely. Am I right? Yes, my lord. The, the so what's your, answer to that? what's your answer to that? The if it's construed widely, if it's construed widely, then the constitutional point doesn't arise. You agree with me? Yes, my lord, we agree. And the appellants have no objection that the phrase per sets of Islam shall be construed widely. Then that goes, there goes your case. What case do you have then? We back to defer, my lord. Our contention here is that if we were to look into section 16, the design of section 16 is open-ended in which section 16 prohibits any publication that is contrary to Islamic law. And as a matter of fact, Almost all the common criminal offences in the penal code and in other federal legislations are at the same time contrary to Islamic law. For example, the publications of pornography, publication of defamatory statements, publication to promote drugs, and so on and so forth. Thus, our contention here is that because the way Section 16 is drafted, we, where Section 16 prohibits any publication that's contrary to Islamic law, then Section 16 can be expanded without any limitation to include many common criminal offences. And such as, such as, such as, give an example. My Lord, the offence of, uh, to the publication of pornography is uh, prohibited by Section 292 of the Penal Code. But at the same time, publication of pornography is a publication that's contrary to Islamic law. And some applies to the publication to but, promote drugs. Yeah, there can be legislation that can run concurrently, isn't it? You can have concurrent legislation on the same subject. My Lord. Can't you, can't you have concurrent legislation on the same subject? My Lord, we back to defer and we refer to the recent, recent federal court case of Iki Putra 2021. Was Iki Wait. Putra correctly decided? In our respectful opinion, my lord, yes, it is. No, uh, Leonard Frank is going to argue, no doubt, that Ikiputra is wrongly decided. My lord, we beg to differ as the Ikiputra is decided by the full bench of the nine, pen, nine members, nine member panel in the federal court, and the reasoning is sound. And according to Ikiputra, a law that carries penal punishment is a criminal law unless it falls within the scope of purely religious offences, known as tadil offences in Islamic jurisprudence. And the court- Is the civil court to determine which are Islamic offences and which are non-Islamic offences? Can we determine? Or should the Sharia court determine? How would we but, know? I don't know anything about Islamic offences. My Lord, the federal court is the apex court and the superior court, uh, there, is, there has long been, long, long been described as the superior court of unlimited jurisdiction. And the court is the guardian of our federal constitution. And in federal lists, in the federal constitution, criminal, criminal lawmaking power is exclusive to the central and federal parliament. So in this context, the court has the power to determine whether a law has encroached into the item of criminal law. 
So, my lords, since section 16 of the SCOE carries penal punishment, and the design is open-ended in which it can encroach into the item of criminal law and include many common criminal offenses, we submit that the, the, the effect is that section 16 will fall under the item of criminal law. My lords, turning to the second ground, it is our contention that the Salangor State Legislature is incompetent to make laws which fall under the, item, the items in the federal list. The power of the Salangor State Legislature to make law is subject to a constitutional limit known as preclusion clause found in item one of the state list. This preclusion clause allows the state legislature to enact offenses against the precepts of Islam, except in regard to matters included in the federal list. So what are and, precepts of Islam? Mr. Tan, can you tell us what are precepts of Islam? We don't know. My Lord. So how, how do we make the determination? My Lord, Even as the apex court, how do we make the determination? Even if we are the apex court, how do we make the determination? According to the case of Sulaiman Takrib and also Ikiputra, the precepts of Islam shall be construed widely to include the Sharia law, the doctrines and belief under the Sharia law. And the appellants do not dispute on that. But the, the contention here is that under item one of the state list, the power to enact offenses against the precepts of Islam is subject to preclusion clause, where preclusion clause provides this power is except in regard to matters included in the federal list. And since the item of criminal law is included in item 4H of the federal list, then meaning to say, while the Salangor State Legislature can enact offenses against the precepts of Islam, but this offense cannot trespass into the item of criminal law or cannot be a criminal law in itself. And we submit it is the case following our submission earlier where the section 16 has an open-ended design. Uh, Mr. Tan, Mr. Tan, but uh, if I recall uh, correctly, uh, the decision in Anu Abraham case, you know, the Sodom case where there was a challenge and the federal court says that uh, it can run concurrently, even the Sharia court can hear the jurisdiction as well as civil court. Now, how do you going to reconcile that? <clears throat> my Lord, while we do appreciate my last view on this, but we beg to differ as according to the case of Ikiputra, it, it is status that it stated that the previous cases have not given sufficient weight to the preclusion clause found in item one of the state list. And this preclusion clause expressly provides that when the matters are provided in the federal list, then the state legislature cannot enact law that will um, encroach into that item in the federal list. And we submit that. And, and, and you're, sorry, and you're saying that. It is the federal court that has the jurisdiction to determine uh, whether it's going to the left or going to the right, is it? And uh, nobody else, is it? Are you saying that it's the federal court has the, the say to determine whether it's within the preclusion or not? Are you saying well, that? This is, this is indeed the power given to the federal court known as the original and exclusive jurisdiction pursuant to Article 4.3 and 4.4 of the federal constitution, in mm -hmm. which the federal court is in the position to determine whether a law the, 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 the legislative body is competent or not to make the law. When your application before us is on Article 4.4, is it? Indeed, my lord. That's the case. And my lords, we submit that this mechanism designed by the drafter of our, of our constitution in which the uh, power of the central and federal parliament will um, be dominant than that of the state legislature is for a sound reason, which is uh, the, as noted by the federal court in Ikiputra, that's to ensure that there will only be one set of criminal law, a standardized criminal law in Malaysia. In, instead of 13 different sets of criminal law in 13 states in Malaysia, and that will uh, obstruct the uniform enforcement of law, my laws. But if you are right then, then, then no other body in Malaysia can uh, legislate uh, or create a, crim uh, a, crim uh, a crime then. For instance, uh, in Sabah, we have uh, criminal offences under the native law. So are you now saying that all those provisions are unconstitutional? 
My Lord, as the federal law, federal list does provide expressly that the item of criminal law I is... I think your answer should be, Mr. Tan, my learned brother, that the answer is to be found in the judgment of Justice Abdul Qadir in <laughs> Harun Idris, isn't it? That each statute is to be tested for its constitutionality on its own strength and not with reference to some other statute. Yes. So but if the Mr. native court the act yeah. comes before us, then we will decide. Uh, but but Mr. Tan's submission is uh, very wide because he said everything <laughs> must be criminal. Yes. So it's a bit of a danger, eh? Yeah. <clears throat> My apologies, my lord. I, I beg your indulgence, and we do agree to the view expressed by my lords. Okay. And <laughs> according to the federal court in, in Kiputra, it, it, it is true that every case has to be determined on a case to case basis whether the, the law is a criminal law. And we submit that in our present case, section 16 is a criminal law because of the open ended design, my lords. As such, and they, can, they cannot be concurrent authority to the state. In, in this matter, my lords, uh, in section 16, we, we submit cannot because uh, only the parliament is in the position to, to, to enact. But the state legislature has still the power to enact tazel offences, which are purely religious in nature and which are not open-ended. Mr. Tan, could I just uh, uh, ask you this? Can you have a situation where the state uh, uh, enacts an, an offence which carries, say, a month, a year imprisonment, but there's no corresponding criminal uh, offence in the penal code or whatever. Now, um, can't you argue in that circumstances, even that contravenes uh, the, uh, fed the federal constitution is that uh, the federal uh, parliament has the right to uh, enact criminal law. I mean, so you have to determine what is criminal law and whether that overrides precept of Islam, isn't it? Is there a conflict there sometimes? How would you resolve that? That brings me to the exception created in Ikebutra, where the court opined that there's one instance, namely the Tazo offences, that although these Tazo offences carry penal punishment, they are not considered as criminal law because they are purely based on the religious duties among Muslims, such as payment of zakat and non-consumption of wine. And we submit in that uh, scenario, then the state legislature can enact the law with one year of imprisonment. That, that will be fine, my lord. Okay, all right. Much of right. My Lord, as but even such, then, suppose suppose the state legislature enacts a law which says that anyone who drinks wine will be flogged to death in public. Uh, would that be all right? My Lord, that go, goes against the uh, limitation of the punishment that can be sentenced. No, suppose by the, the state, state legislature is, a, is given the power to impose any punishment. In respect Lord, of Islamic law. In, in that case, the issue of the basic structure is will be raised in which uh, the doctrine is not settled yet in Malaysia. No, I think it is settled. It's been unsettled by people who are unsettled. <laughs> yeah. My Lord, as such, I conclude um, our submission on the first issue, which where the section 16 has been enacted ultra bias. Moving on to the second issue, the appellants submit that. In the event the first issue is answered in the negative, section 16 of SCOE is still void for being inconsistent with Article 10.1a of the Federal Constitution, where Article 10 guarantees the freedom of speech. But and the freedom of speech is not absolute, isn't it? Indeed, my lord. But according to so Article 10.2a... There's a proportionate legislation. If the legislation is proportionate, then uh, it meets the test. Azmi Sharon's case. Indeed, my lord. But before this proportionality test can be invoked, the, our contention here is that the restriction to the freedom of speech shall be made under Article 10.2a, where only the federal, uh, my apologies, where only the parliament is in the position to restrict the freedom of so wrong speech. Wrong, wrong legislative body. Indeed, my lord. That will be our contention. And Referring to the respondent uh, written memorial, the re respondent, my learned friends from respondents argue that um, Article 11.4, which allows for the state to control propagation of Islamic teachings, shall be read harmoniously with Article 10.1a, uh, so that the, this section 16 will not be pro uh, prohibited under Article 10.1a. But my lords, the appellants back to differ. The, 
we, we submit that in trying to read Article 11.4 harmoniously with Article 10.1a, the issue of retrospective law is bound to arise, thus making any purported harmonious interpretation impossible here. My lord, my lords, Article 7 of the Federal Constitution prohibits retrospective law. But if we were to look into Section 16, there's no mechanism prescribed to ascertain what publication is contrary to Islamic law and what publication is not. In almost all the circumstances, as in the present case, a book, when being published, is not ascertained as contrary to Islamic law. It is only after the publication that the book will be ascertained as contrary to Islamic law, but this status of illegality will be imputed to the book back to the moment when the book was first being published. We submit that this is a violation of Article 7. But and isn't that true of every publication? That uh, you take, for example, the publications which are prohibited under the penal code. If the uh, publication was uh, uh, seized two years after its original publication, the offense predates to the date on which the first publication occurred. So it's also uh, retrospective in that sense, isn't it? My Lord, am I wrong? if I'm wrong, why am I wrong? Our position is that that has to be examined on a case-to-case -case basis. For example, let's say that, let, uh, take the pub prohibition to um, publish the obscene material in the penal code. The obscene, uh, whether a book is obscene or not, will be ascertained only after the publication. But we, we, the appellant submit that it doesn't go against Article 7 because whether a book is obscene or not is based on the reasonable, reasonable man test in which it is based on the standard of the society and the court will determine whether such a book is acceptable to the standard in the society and the appellants are part of the society. So the appellant shall have the knowledge. But here, whether a book is contrary to Islamic law or not, it only um, depends on the honorable mufti. And if I may uh, refer this court- You're talking to... about classification. You're talking about classification, classification of the law as being, classification of the publication as being uh, offensive to uh, Islamic law. Indeed, my lord. If I may refer this honorable court to page three of the facts of the case, paragraph 7.1. Yes. Page three, paragraph 7.1. Uh, the Japatan Agama Islam, Nagri Salano Jais, decided to seek the opinion of the Honorable Mufti of Salano on the book. So this shows that even the Honorable Mufti is not in, uh, my apologies, this shows that even Jais is not in the position to tell whether the book is contrary to Islamic law or not without referring to the Honorable Mufti. But there are and, bodies, you know, in the, in the ordinary law which uh, have by statute to refer questions of Islamic law to other bodies. Uh, for example, in the Bang Nigara case, uh, where my yeah. learned brothers- JRI, JRI case. JRI resources. Uh, my learned brothers uh, wrote the minority, but correct view. The majority view was of course wrong, but then we are bound to follow the majority. View. Thank you, thank you. Right. But unfortunately, we don't have uh, any law that prohibits, uh, the, there's no provision in the constitution that pro prohibits a court from, uh, or a body from referring an Islamic uh, question to an Islamic body. Mm. But, but I, I would, I would, I would uh, uh, say this, is it not, uh, Mr. Tan, that there was an abdication of duty on the part of uh, Jais, is it not? Can you say that? They, were, they, they abdicated their, their function. My Lord, my Lord, before, before I answer the questions, uh, I noticed that I'm running out of time and my request for an extension of two minutes to uh, answer the questions and to yeah, wrap up my <laughs> Much obliged. My Lord, we do agree that um, there, there, there shall be a body to determine whether a law is going against Islamic law or not. But looking at section 16, such a mechanism is not provided. It, 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 is, it is not requested that any publisher shall ascertain the status mm. of the book mm. prior to the publication. Mm. And 
for, for this reason, it, it, it is for this reason that we submit that the uh, section 16, that we cannot impose an extra obligation that's not prescribed in section 16 to the appellant that will be unfair and offend the sense of justice, my lords. Yeah, but the majority in the Lina Joy case allowed that when the director general of the registration were asked, were allowed to refer the matter to the uh, body, I think, and, and then they said accepted it. So how then you reconcile that? Is that is that the right uh, trend to do where the, the, the DG made reference and literally followed what was said, uh, was advised by the religious body? My Lord, it is a rule of natural justice and also a right granted by Article 7 that the appellants cannot be requested to do more than what the law has expressly required from it at the moment when the uh, it at, at the when the action was carried out. My apologies. Thus, um, we submit that in this sense, uh, Lina joined shall be reconsidered by this honorable court, my lord. <laughs> you say that the majority in Lina Joy is wrong, the minority is correct. And the judgment of the Court of Appeal was right. Is that your case? My lords, the appellants will agree to that. <laughs> now I think run out of time. All right. <laughs> Sorry, Mr. Tan. <laughs> no. right. As such, my lords, I yield the floor to my okay. co-counsel. Okay. Uh, May please the court. Much of much. <laughs> right. Yes, who is it? Sakina, is it? My last, before I begin, may I confirm, am I audible and visible? Yes. yes. Much obliged, my lords. Will it please this honourable court? My name is Sakina Siraj, and I am the co-counsel acting on behalf of the appellant, Samira Binti Sulaiman and Samira Publishing, Sanyuan Bahad. My lords, I will be now arguing on the third and fourth issues of law for the remaining time. The third issue concerns the jurisdiction of the Sharia court pertaining... See, before you talk about the jurisdiction, you see, your, your case is that a company cannot profess a religion, correct? Yes, my lord. Now, if is the law uh, concerned with labels or is it concerned with substance, Ms. Sakina? My lord... The court Answer the first, question. Is it um, concerned with labels or is it concerned with substance? My Lord, it will concern the label first to be able to first charge uh, who is the party no, to be charged. The law is the always first. concerned with substance, substance, not substance. labels. The law is not concerned. You can call a cat a dog. Mm -hmm. That won't change. It. It won't confer any uh, canine qualities on it. <laughs> Well, a ross, a ross is always a ross, yeah? Yes. <laughs> so what of a name? Or an inversion thereof. Or an inversion thereof. <laughs> but, so what is your answer if I were to put it to you that your company, your client, the corporate, your corporate client, is in fact a mirror image or an alter ego of the first appellant and therefore is to be identified as a Muslim? What is your answer to that? Because there is no doubt that Samira is a Muslim. Right? And if Samira Publications is controlled entirely by Samira herself, isn't it right that the law should be able to lift the corporate veil and make the company liable for what uh, Samira did? What's your answer to that? On the, yes. on the rules of attribution. Yes, my Lord. I respectfully agree to that submission. Um, apologies. I agree to that um, point, my lord. However, we are submitting on the point that first, the uh, company, apologies, my lord, the party should be charged, which is the company first, because it can be also seen from the facts of the case that the company is the party which has done the act of publishing the book. And even though Samira is the sole director and shareholder, to be able to pierce the corporate veil first, the company first has to be charged, my lords, and this I will be addressing in my submissions as well. If my lords allow, I will uh, answer in, in really in my submissions as well, my lords. All right. Much obliged. My lords, we submit that the charge against Samira is null and void on two grounds. 
First is that SPSB possesses a separate legal entity from Samira. And second, in any case, the doctrine of lifting of the corporate veil is inapplicable to the Sharia court. My lords, it is child law that when a company but is you're not before the Sharia court, you're before the federal court. Yes, my lord. However, the, the question of law which has to be answered is whether the Sharia court has the charge, uh, has the jurisdiction pertaining the charge um, laid against Samira. And on that basis, we argue that the company has a separate legal entity from Samira. And this is also given in the Section 21 of the Companies Act, which provides that a company shall have a full capacity to be able to enter into business transactions and also has the capacity to sue and to but be We sued. are not dealing with the corporate law, with the corporate law here, Mr. Kina. We are dealing with the criminal law. In the field of criminal law, having regard to cases like National Coal Board and Gamble, having regard to uh, cases uh, that have to do with corporate criminal responsibility. In those cases, like income tax cases, for example, the corporate veil affords no protection at all because otherwise the persons behind the company would be able to shield themselves from the cup in, in the, in, with the corporate veil and escape criminal liability. So in those circumstances, you have to address your mind to this particular problem. You are answering some other question. Mm. Yes, my Lord. The question which we are asking you is, in relation to criminal responsibility, can the mm. veil of incorporation mm. be lifted? Maybe you have to consider, Sakina, we have to consider whether that offense so-called is a strict liability offense to begin with. Or you need a uh, menstrual or whatever. And you cannot attribute that to the company. My lords, in lifting the corporate veil, it first has to be seen whether the Sharia court will have the jurisdiction in the first place. And we submit that even though the corporate veil can be pierced in order to hold the shareholder or the officer liable, we submit that the Sharia court does not have the power to do so and only the civil courts can. And we base this on two arguments, my lords. First is that SPSB is an artificial legal entity which cannot profess any religion, including Islam, and therefore does not fall under the jurisdiction of the Sharia court. And second is that the piercing of corporate veil is only applicable to the civil courts. And my Aren't lords, you putting the cart before the horse? You see, you have to lift the corporate veil first, then you make the company liable under, under Sharia law. Then it becomes liable under Sharia law. Not that you cannot be charged under Sharia law. You lift the corporate veil first, and then you become liable under the Sharia law. Otherwise, what is the purpose of having a Sharia law? Um, if you can't yeah. enforce it against a company which is owned by a Muslim. Sole shareholder, sole director Muslim, you cannot lift the veil of incorporation. Why not? Why can't you do it? My lord, it is provided under the Companies Act that um, a sole shareholder... A so sole your answer is then that the Companies Act jurisdiction is not exercisable by the Sharia court. Is yes. that correct? Yes, Thank correct, you. my lord. And the jurisdiction of the Sharia court is also clearly confined to persons who profess the religion of Islam. And pursuant to those wordings, the interpretation of persons should be read within the confines of the jurisdiction of the Sharia court. And in a similar instance, the interpretation of persons was called for in the case of the... Apologies, my lord. In the 1998 federal court case of Kesultanan Pahang and Satak Sriyali Sunyan Bahad, the court had stated that in interpreting the word persons, according to Section 2 of the Interpretations Act, it should be examined from the context in which the persons is used in the specific provision or enactment. And since the contention in that case was whether the company can be considered a subject of the ruler, it was decided that it was only limited to natural persons who can be legally subject to the ruler and a Malay who speaks the language and professes the religion of Islam. My lords, in the similar instance in our case, SPSB being an artificial entity cannot profess any religion on itself. And it will be also wrong to assume the religion of the company through its shareholders. The position was also taken in the 2020 Court of Appeal case of Z Publications, 
where the court had admitted that a company cannot assume to hold a certain religion by identifying the shareholders who do practice the religion of Islam. My lords, also by looking at the context of item one of the state list, where it states that persons who profess the religion of Islam should only be limited to natural persons. And company, by its very nature, who are creatures of the statute and cannot profess any religion. My Lord? It's a, uh, Islamic law, the Sharia court only deals with personal law, you know, personal law, is it not? Yes, correct, my Lord. Right? Uh, Islamic law, for that matter, even indigenous law are something very much personal laws, isn't it? Yes, my Lord. Okay. My Lord, in any case, we are not submitting that the corporate will cannot be pierced. However, we are here to submit that the Sharia court does not have the jurisdiction to pierce the corporate will. And since at the very you beginning... You said that three times already. You understand <laughs> that. Apologies, my Lord. <laughs> my Lord, if there are no further questions for this particular issue, I shall now move on to the fourth issue of law. Okay. Yes. Apol Much obliged, my Lords. My Lord, the last question which has to be determined by this honourable court is whether the grounds of likely to alarm public opinion and likely to be prejudicial to public interests stated under Section 7.1 of the Printing Presses and Publications Act violate Article 10.2a of the Federal Constitution. My Lords, Article 10.2a of the Federal Constitution empowers Parliament to restrict uh, freedom my of learned speech. Brother, my learned brother Richard Malanjun and I, speaking for the court in Sivarasa, have set out the ambit of that phrase. Precisely, my lord. Public order. Right? Yes, so yes my lord. Public order can be, can be read wi widely. Anything that upsets mm. the regular tempo of the life of society is contrary to public order. Yes, my lord. Before addressing to that issue, I would just want to emphasize on one particular matter, which was also decided in the case of Siva Rasa Rasya, which was also uh, reaffirmed in the case of Maria Chin Abdullah, that a fundamental liberty has to be read generously and the restrictions on those liberties read in a narrow manner. My lords, the respondents also took the view that the term public order should be read widely to include um, likely to alarm public opinion and likely to be prejudicial against public interest, justifying the two restrictions. However, yeah, who, who decide? But Sekina, who then decide? Is there a sole authority to decide what's a public order and what is not? Uh, what is not? Or we give it to some fella uh, behind the curtain? Precisely, my lord. It is for the courts to determine what goes it's against public order. Yes, my lord. And we we've already said that. Mm. We've already said that. Mm. We said what we've already said. If it if it interrupt, if it disrupts, mm. if it disrupts the, the normal tempo, the even tempo of society, of ordinary life in society, mm. then it is against public order. So if you go and disgruntle the number of Muslims through your publication, which will likely to cause them to uprise, that affects public order. That's the answer to your question, isn't it? Am I wrong? Um, my lords, my lords, um, I humbly, um, we humbly submit that the fourth issue of law does not concern the um, issue whether the book does go against public order or it does alarm public opinion. It is just a matter of the constitutionality of the two grounds included in section seven and whether it falls under the permissible restrictions under article 10 to A of the federal constitution, my lords. Thank you. My lords, the case of, to determine the constitutionality of a restriction, uh, it was pronounced in the 1994 Supreme Court case of Pung Chen Chun, which the court had stated, stated that a consideration has to be given whether the impugned restriction is directed at a class too remote or not sufficiently connected to the subjects enumerated in Article 10 to A. The appellants submit that the term public order entails a situation of a grave nature. The American case of Cartiwell and Connecticut, apologies, the American case of Cartiwell and Connecticut, which was also applied in the case of Tan Boon Liat and Menteri Hal Ewal Dalam Negeri, it was stated that the public order 
is guarded when there is a real danger of riots or poses an immediate threat to public safety. My Lord. According to, according to uh, what I've read in the papers, even calling a whiskey tima is going to cause a lot of problems. So, a lot of, lot of racial problems. So, how? My Lord. Uh, my Lord. Everybody, um, all, all, apparently, all Muslims in this country are very sensitive. That's where the problem starts when you leave it to one human being to decide mm. and not to, uh, on, uh, to the courts. Mm. My lord, not to the secular court. Mm. My lord, we humbly submit that it is decided on a case to case basis on that particular matter. However, when we refer to these two restrictions, which is under Section 7, it is too far fetched from the permissible rest restriction of public order in that case. And when we look at the ground of likely to alarm public opinion, um, my lords, since there are no statutory definitions or case laws which expound on this term, we refer to the dictionary to get a clear understanding of the term. And the Cambridge Dictionary defines alarm as making someone worried and public opinion as opinions which people in society have on an issue. And essentially, alarming public opinion would mean when people are frightened of an opinion of a certain issue. And additionally, public interest was also defined in the case, in the 2013 Court of Appeal case of Titula Roman Archbishop, um, where public interest encompasses public order and not the case that public order encompassing public interest. My Lord, by looking at the interpretations of these terms, the threshold in which freedom of speech and expression is restricted is when a danger of a grave nature which disturbs public tranquility as opposed to merely causing a fright in the society, let alone merely likely to cause the public alarm and so likely- in other words, The test is very high, standard is very high. Mm -hmm. Yes, my Lord. The threshold is very high? Yes, my Lord. And that but is test that against the presumption of constitutionality. You are asking us to strike down the statute. So you begin with the presumption of constitutionality. So how does your, your argument bend or break that presumption? My Lord, we are contending on the point that these two grounds are too far-fetched from the permissible restrictions under Article 10 to A. And as I have submitted, oh, why, my Lord- Why, why is it too far-fetched? Yeah. I mean, I mean uh, my London brother says seems to be very comfortable in, in in saying that they are well equipped to determine what is public order and uh, public interest, and some, you know, and not some uh, uh, bureaucrats. I mean, uh, <laughs> how, how, how? I mean, uh, I, I, speaking for myself, I, I'd be uh, quite uncomfortable uh, to decide whether it, it, it would cause public disorder or not. I don't, I don't know. I don't have uh, intelligence. <laughs> so, how does the court uh, determine? My Lord, we humbly submit that in, in that matter, we submit that even if, if the court allows these two restrictions, which <coughs> is only likely to be uh, alarming public opinion and just likely to be prejudicial against public interest, it will give effects to two things. First is that it will render the minister power under Section 7 of the PPPA to restrict freedom of speech and expression on its own terms and to merely protecting the society from frightening opinions. Okay, so, second, so, how, so how does a judge come to a decision to say that, that, <laughs> that the minister has overstepped the, 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 the boundary of reasonableness? How, how, how is a judge to, to determine that? I understand um, where you're coming from. You should not, uh, no minister should have absolute discretion. Or, yes, you know. But yes. how does the judge determine he has overstepped the line? Um, yes, my lord. And if there are discourses, um, apologies, my lord, there is a recourse to making a judicial review on the matter if the ministers has not reasonably used the powers. However, that doesn't answer if, my learned brother's question. My learned brother's question is how do we as judges find out, determine what is going to be within the confines of public order, isn't it? something which we are ill-equipped to do because we do not have the information mm. which the minister is possessed of, which is intelligence from the police. We do not have that. The court is not equipped with that. 
You understand? Yes, my lord. Yes, right. my lord. So, what is your answer to my learned brother's question? I'm waiting for your answer. Apologies, my lord. The courts will use the test of subjective. My lord, apologies. The court subjectively objective test, my lord, to determine whether the situation does um, entail a situation of a public order, my lord. What is the subjectively objective test? It's either subjective or objective. And uh, we, I'm, I know for a fact that after 1999, there is no more subjective test. It's all objective. Oh, that was used, I think, in the Titula Roman. Uh, ah. uh, that was the that yes. was the first time that it resurfaced, and uh, yeah. unfortunately, it couldn't be killed off by the federal court. But it has died a natural death, I suppose, <laughs> to, the, to other decisions which have come since then, which has ignored it. The majority in uh, the mm. titular, mm. the titular mm. bishop case was mm. clearly wrong. Mm. Because that was a case for leave, not even substantive appeal. Right. So the question whether it's an arguable issue to go to the federal court. The court went into the merits. My learned brother, mm. <laughs> David Wong, is off screen. No, I, 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 I have trouble with my internet. I can hear all of you. Okay. Um, I'll just wait till for the speaker to finish and I have to re-lock in again. That's mm. going to happen. That's right. All right. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Okay, wind, I can up, hear you. wind up, Sakina. Um, apologies, my lord. Um, my lord, before I just end my submissions, I would like to quote a, pres a quote um, from Lord President Saleh Abbas. The courts have a constitutional function to perform, and they are in the guardian of the constitution within the terms and structure of the constitution itself. My lords, even the parliament, even the lawmaking body who has enacted these impugned restrictions in section seven to prohibit undesirable publication, the court still has to take cognizance of the fact that the constitution has already enumerated the restrictions of freedom and speech and expression. And so your enacting... argument simply is this, that you cannot put in a ground which is not to be found in 10 to 8. Mm. Yes, my lord. That's it, isn't it? Yes, my lord. And what the section does is it enlarges the area of restriction beyond 10 to 8. Precisely, my lord. And enacting additional restrictions, which has already been enumerated, it will be an attempt to bypass the amendment of the constitution and allowing the legislator to make laws carte blanche. My lords, if I am of no further assistance to this honorable court, in light of the submissions made, we request the court to rule in favor of the appellants. I rest my case, my lords, and I thank the court for its time and indulgence. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Uh, chairman, Mr. Uh, chairman, yeah. Yeah, chairman, uh, could you just give me one minute? I have to yes, lock and lock back on. Okay. Right.
Yes, I'm right. Okay. Oh, okay. Yes, I'm back, uh, Chairman. Mm, you had. So, yeah. Members of the court, am I audible? First, first respondent, yep. Sorry, David, yeah. First yep. respondent, yes, Amelia. Yes, my lord. Uh, if I'm audible, I'll begin. Yes, yes, you are. May it please the court, my name is Amelia Lai and I act as the counsel for the respondent, Karajaan Nuguri Slamo, and others. I will be addressing the first and second issues before this court, while my co-counsel, Ms. Chan Ching Yi, will address the third and fourth issues. Honorable members of the court, my submissions will rest on two grounds. Firstly, section 16 of the SUOE is valid as the legislature of Selango has power to make such laws. Secondly, how can it make such laws if the preclusion clause does not, is, is to be given effect? You have to address that first. All right? In the course of your argument, you have to address that. All right? I'll wait for your answer on the preclusion clause. Okay? Much obliged, my lord. This was just my summary of the grounds. So okay. secondly, section 16 of the SEOE does not violate Article 10 sub 1A or Article 11 of the Federal Constitution. Turning to my first ground, which will rest on three points. The appellant raises that Section 16 of the SEOE is vastly, in his terms, open-ended. And the content of the book, Gay is Okay, from a Muslim perspective, is not regulated. The respondent submits that Section 16 of the SEOE is a specified offence and pertains to a purely Islamic religious offence under the state list. This is provided that in Z publications in Deram Bahad and Karajaan Negeri Selangor by the federal court, the intention of section 16 of the SEOE is to control propagation of deviant Islamic teachings in the form of written content. A list of deviant Islamic teachings is actually gazetted under the Selangor Gazette, such as teachings of pluralism and liberalism. Furthermore, section 27 of the SEOE also regulates homosexual relationships. And is, the, is a Muslim, uh, does a Muslim have freedom to practice his religion? My Lord. In the yes. state of Slango, does a Muslim have freedom to practice his religion? Yes, my Lord. However, that freedom- Then who determines, who determines he has freedom? My Lord. That freedom. A group, of, a group of people sitting in a building, is it? A group of chaps, <laughs> uh, all dressed in white, sitting in a building. <laughs> My Lord, to clarify, yes, Muslims do have the freedom of religion. However, this freedom is subjected to Article 11, Sub 4. When it so they, cannot be, they cannot be subjected to the teachings of other religions. In other words, I cannot go around asking a Muslim to convert to Hinduism, proselytizing is not allowed. I accept that. But as a Muslim, if I'm a Muslim and I decide I want to drink and I want to drink Tima whiskey, uh, why should a group of people say that the way I practice my religion should be in a particular way? My Lord. Who are you to determine, who are these people to determine the way I should practice my religion? That is my question. Number one. Number two, whichever way you look at it, don't you agree with me that if they contravene the provisions of the section, which is now under review, the consequence is that the offender will be subjected to criminal punishment, to the penal law. Do you agree? My Lord, the respondent humbly begs to differ, and we will address both of your so questions. So you, you mean, you mean you'll, you'll, you'll be sent home, is it? With a scolding, that's all. No, my Lord. Hmm. A and Muslim will be subjected to Sharia law, by specifically on this case, Section 16 of the SUE. However, to address my Lord's first question, uh, in summary, with regards to the other religions, in, in practice, Muslims under Salamo practice, uh, adopt the school of thought of Sunni Islam and other religions, other types of school of thoughts under Islam that is gazetted as a deviant teaching would be construed as other religions, such as uh, Ahmadiyya Islam or, or 
uh, Hadith Islam, these different types of interpretation of Islam will also be rendered as uh, construed as other teachings. With regards to my Lord's second question, uh, due to the apl applicability of criminal law, the appellant applies the case of Iki Putra heavily on our facts, claiming that the respondent has overstepped its jurisdiction with regards to enacting criminal law. However, the respondent submits that Section 16 of the SEA <laughs> is an Islamic religious offence, which is distinct from criminal law defined under the federal constitution. And my Lord previously also questioned whether there was a distinction between Islamic law and criminal law. This distinction was explained in the federal court case of Sulaiman bin Taqib and Karajaan Negeri Terengganu that offences against the precepts of Islam is a religious Islamic religious offence that fell within the items enumerated in the state list and it can only be made specifically binding on Muslims. On the other hand, the federal court explained that criminal law was to regulate crimes under the items enumerated in the federal list, which, is, which has secular applicability and general applicability to all Malaysians. My honorable members of the court, the case of Iki Putra resides on different facts and issues. The council does not wish to, uh, to, to, to submit that Iki Putra was made per inquirium. However, it is, not, it is merely not applicable to our facts. What is, why, why is it not applicable? The Iki Putra said that the earlier decisions of the Court of Appeal and Federal Court on, on Sharia law, cases emanating from Sharia, the, from, on issues of Islamic, Islamic law, overlooked the preclusion clause in the sh schedule. And uh, therefore, they, were, they are to be read cautiously. There's nothing wrong with that. Yes, number, my two, number two, what is your answer to appellant's submission that the section is open-ended? You have not addressed that argument. What is your answer to that? My now, Lord, answer it now. No, I'm not. We are not prepared to wait. You answer it now. With now. regards to the open-ended argument, yes. the respondent has clarified that it is not open-ended with regards to what encompasses within uh, what is against what is contrary to Sharia law. But there is already a law which punishes somebody for making publications. There is already a federal federal law. That, that governs the subject. So you cannot have another law made by another body which subjects a person twice. Because then a Muslim would be liable both under the penal code and under the state law. Do you agree with me? Yes, my Lord, exactly. And that's the end of your case. However, my Lord, to clarify further on the matter, we understand that Mr. President has concerns whether laws can regulate the same subject matter. However, just Chief, Chief Justice Tengku Maimoud, in, her, in, in the decision of Iki Putra, explains that two streams of law can coexist if the subject matter is distinguished. And the presumption of constitutionality rests on the appellant to distinguish the subject matter. Previously, my Lord also questioned whether there was a concurrent law that is present on our facts due to the appellant's broad argument on Islamic criminal law. We submit that the concurrent law that should be examined is the Printing Presses and Publication Act. That is, that was also examined in Z publication. These two But the constitutionality of that act itself is now under question. Mm. In this case. Yes, my Lord. This is because in order to apply the preclusion clause, if we were to follow the procedure of Iki Putra, the federal court in Iki Putra had to juxtapose section 377 of the penal code and section 28 of the SEOE to discern whether there was a commonality between the subject matter in order to apply the preclusion clause. However, opposing counsel has not provided the court with the concurrent, uh, concurrent legislation un under federal law, which we will do so now, which is the PPPA Act. Hence, if we were to look into the, we were, look, we were, into, we were to look into Iki Putra, in arriving to their decision, Section 377 of the Penal Code and Section 28 regulated the same subject matter of carnal intercourse against the order of nature, otherwise known as unnatural sex. Hence, to charge 
an individual under Section 28, it was a mirrored ground under Section 377. Hence the what, how different is it here? The difference I'm, I'm trying to understand how, how different, I've read, your, I've read your memorial. I can't understand the difference. My Lord, oh. the difference is under Section 16 of the SEOE to charge an individual, one must merely possess content or publish content that, has, that is in violation of Sharia law. However, this is not equivalent to adducing evidence that can render one liable under the PPPA. The PPPA regulates undesirable publication on the grounds of public order, public morality, and public interest. And also rightfully raised by my Lord, public order is about the even tempo of society. And it also can be related to public tranquility or disruption on public safety. What is contrary to Islamic law in the publication is not equivalent to the grounds of public order, morality, and interest. And this is shown- But in don't the they case coincide? Don't they coincide in the concentric circle argument? My Lord- the Concentric circle, circle argument, where public safety, public order, and national security. National security is the widest, the biggest of the concentric circle. Public order is the smallest. Mr. President, we humbly beg to differ. The only commonality is the book. Whether the book, however, under the PPPA, it can regulate any book, regardless if the book is a religious book or non-religious book. However, it must be examined from a different lens in comparison to Section 16 of the SEOE. The lens of observation, the grounds must be under public order or morality. And for example, in the case of Dato Suri Said, uh, Jaffa Alba against Sister in Islam. In this Court of Appeal case, the Home Minister attempted to argue that the book was in contravention to Jakim guidelines because it had content that was against Islamic teachings. However, the Court of Appeal held that a mere violation of Jakim guidelines does not amount to a ground of public order. Public order must illustrate a disruption to the even tempo of life such as in the case that was also raised by the, the opposing counsel entitled Roman Catholic Archbishop. I think the, the majority judgment, you can forget about the majority judgment in the, in the titular uh, 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 Roman Bishop case. I don't think we are prepared to accept that as good law. <laughs> we are not prepared, you can forget about it. It, it should be in the words of Lord Denning in the King uh, Smith case, uh, placed on a pile that says not to be looked at after this, <laughs> not to be looked at uh, at all, <laughs> placed on a pile marked not to be looked at. <laughs> so you don't worry about the majority of that case. You address your arguments based on Ikiputra. My Lord, if that's the case, then the submission being is that the grounds of public order and morality and interest as, as defined by my Lord itself, it's, it's vastly different right. from what the grounds of Section 16 of the SEOE will pertain. Section 16 of the SEOE will render one liable if a Muslim were just to publish publication contrary to Islamic law, meaning that even if it's contravening homosexuality or, or consumption of alcohol, promoting these, these laws that are already enumerated in Sharia law, a contravention of it would render one liable. Uh, could I just ask you, is there, there's no question of um, discrimination here, you know, the, the, the supporting judgment of uh, Justice Asaha, uh or in the Iki Putra case? Is there is there an issue of uh, discrimination in, in, our, in our case? My Lord, discrimination was discussed in Iki Putra. However, it is not applicable in our case because the law regulates different subject matters. It was, it was, it was prejudicial in what subject matter are you talking about counsel you're talking about criminal law you're talking about the criminal law same subject matter subject matter is criminal law my lord however it was raised by my lord that it the appellant's arguments were too broad on what criminal law could encompass under Sharia law and we we have distinguished that section 16 of the SUE is not a criminal law my lord Section 16 of the SEOE. If you contravene, offense, if you contravene section 16, what happens? Miss Emilia Lai, if I contravene, if I as a Muslim contravene section 16, what happens? I get a present, is it? I get a bouquet of flowers. 
<laughs> what happens? You get and you one, get to my pulo. <laughs> and uh, if one were to contravene section 16 of the SEOE, mm. he or she would be liable for an imprisonment for not more than two years. Yes, yeah, so you go to jail. That is penal in nature. That's why I'm saying the appellant has addressed the correct subject matter, criminal law. You are addressing the wrong subject matter. My lord, agree. We, we still humbly beg to differ. This is because in Ikiputra, to examine, to examine whether the preclusion clause can apply and whether there was overlaps between the federal list and the state list, a federal law must be juxtaposed with a, a state law. And in that case, it was the penal code. However, the respondent's argument is not applicable. The respondent did not raise a penal code provision that is mirroring section 16 of the SEOE. And the provision within Ikiputra, section 377 of the penal code is with regards to carnal intercourse against the order of nature. This is not a provision that regulates, that, that is directly regulating homosexuality. Homosexuality is covered under section 27 of the SEOE. However, directing the court back to the matter of contention today, it is our humble position that if we were to follow the, the precedent of Iki Putra in juxtaposing both laws to see whether the preclusion clause can apply and whether there was an overlap, one must also, one must also submit a countering, a countering federal law, which in our case is the PPPA Act to juxtapose it with section 16 of the SEOE to discern whether there is the same subject matter, my lord. Yeah, publication. Subject matter is the same. Here is publication of material, there also publication of material. That's the subject matter. My lord, this is why the respondent has, this is why the respondent is going to, is the respondent submits that the doctrine of pith and substance must be used to ascertain the true nature of the offense. And this was held in the case of Z publication, ZI publications in Diran Bahat, which has similar legal issues and similar facts on our case, where the appellant seeks to invalidate section 16, arguing that it has overlapped with publication laws. However, the federal court in ZI publication held that it was clear that section 16, in using the doctrine of pith and substance, laid down in Mamak bin Dawood and government Malaysia, and this doctrine of pith and substance, like my Lord raised, was with regards to not the form, but the substance. And this doctrine was also utilized in the case of Iki Putra to come to a decision that section 16 in its substance pertains to an offense against the precepts of Islam and cannot be under criminal law or publications. But if I publish material, if I'm a Muslim and I want to buy this book, do I commit an offense? Yes, my lord, because under yes. section 16. Yes, why? Because, because one, I, because I'm a Muslim, so I'm discriminated against. And number two, because it's a publication, which is the same subject matter which falls under federal law. What subject falls under federal law is the publication of material proscribed by federal law. Only federal law has power to proscribe the publication of uh, uh, material which falls foul of uh, the limitations set out in Article 10.2a. You see, only Parliament can do that. You follow the argument, Ms. Emilia Lai. Mm. My Lord, we still humbly beg to defer as the respondent because in utilizing the doctrine of pith and well, substance... you want to bang, bang your head against a brick wall, that's your, your, your privilege. <laughs> Carry on. <laughs> my Lord, in summarizing my first argument, that in using the doctrine of pith and substance to focus on the substance and not the form, the word publication, section 16 of the SOE, pertains to a purely Islamic religious offense. Turning to my second ground, which will rest on two points. The respondent submits it is expressly provided under Article 11 sub 4 of the federal constitution that state legislatures have jurisdiction to curtail the freedom of religion. And this was re reaffirmed in the case of Z.I. publication and Mamad bin Dawood, that in order for state legislatures to protect the religion of Islam from being exposed to opinions and other school of thoughts within the Islamic religion itself, by virtue of Article 11 sub 4, 
state legislatures can curtail the freedom of religion. The freedom of religion for Muslims do not apply to equal force for non-Muslims. And this was provided in the Court of Appeal case of Ketua Pengawai Pengawak Kasa Agama and Maskut Ahmad, that freedom of religion for Muslims is subjected to items on the state list. The appellant's argument is inconsistent with Article 11 sub 4. And this was propounded by the federal court in Sulaiman bin Taqrib and Karaja and Nareen. You'll have to wind Nareen. up your argument, counsel. You've got one minute left. Yes, my lord. With the wall that, is still there. Carry on. Due to the express restriction by way of Article 11 sub 4, the, court, the federal court in Sulaiman bin Taqrib says one who seeks to challenge it in the federal court's words is doomed to fail from the start. With that, if the court has no further questions and I will be of no further assistance, the respondent would like to conclude that firstly, section 16 of the SEOE is valid as the state Islamic legislature has power to make such law. Second, section 16 of the SEOE does not violate article 10 or 11 of the federal constitution. We thank the court for its time and indulgence and I will now hand over the third and fourth issues to my co-counsel. Okay. Thank you. Honorable yes. members of the court, am I audible? Yes. Yes. Thank you. I will now proceed with my submission. May it please the court. My name is Chan Xinyi, and I'll be acting as the co-counsel for the respondent. I'll be submitting to this honorable court for 20 minutes with regards to the third and fourth issue. My submission consists of two main points. The first main point is in relation to the third issue, whereby the respondent submit that in the event section 16 of SCOE is a valid law, then the Shara court would have jurisdiction over the matters stated in the charge, as the charge are mainly pertaining to Islamic law. Now and on my before second you, part, before you go one, you, before you take one step further, what is your answer to Sakina's argument, your learned friend Ms. Sakina's argument, that the Sharia court has no jurisdiction over company corporate matters, that is only the civil court which is uh, conferred with jurisdiction to lift the corporate veil or to apply the alter ego proposition principle to uh, the corporate veil. What is your answer to that? Before you uh, go on with your arguments any further, answer that question first, please. Yes, my lord. To answer your question and to respond to, the, to my learned friend submission, my learned friend submitted that Sharia court cannot consider the issue of lifting corporate will as it belongs to the civil law jurisdiction. However, the respondent humbly begged to defer on that. As but that's not enough. You must, you must substantiate your argument. Yeah. Yes, my lord. As relying on the case of Wan Kairani binti Wan Mahmud and Ismail bin Muhammad 2011. In that case, the issue of Sharia court jurisdiction had once again come into question whether Sharia court can consider the issue of lifting corporate will in the claim of Hatta Sepancharian. And the federal court in 2011 had held that using the subject matter approach on that, the subject matter in that case is Hatta Sepancharian, which has clearly fall within the Shara court jurisdiction under, sec under second list nine schedule of the federal constitution. Hence, the determination of company issue in that case itself was merely assisting the Shara court in that matter. And similarly in our case, the issue of SPSP are merely assisting the Shara court in determining the liability of Samira here. This, this is a response of the respondent towards the opposing counsel submission. Moving on, my lord. The respondent submit that firstly, as Mr. President had pointed out just now, during the submission of my learned friend, that the law is always concerned first with the substance of the case. And especially once again to affirm that given the charge are only directed to Samira for offense under section 16 of SCOE, therefore the, there's no mention of SPSB in the charge itself. And hence whether the corporate, whether the company can rely, sorry, 
whether the company can profess any religion itself is irrelevant, given that Samira herself is a Muslim and Shara Khan can. You cannot identify the company with Samira unless you can lift the corporate veil. And the only provisions which allow, which direct a, a, a court in, or, or point a court in that direction are the provisions of the Companies Act uh, 2016. And if you look at the, uh, the Sharia court, it does not administer company law. So where do you go from there? Another brick wall, isn't it? My Lord. Uh, so what is your answer? My Lord, to answer your question, the respondents submit that the corporate veil between SPSP and Samira should be lifted to avoid an abuse of corporate personality. By whom? By whom? By, by the whom? Sharia court, my Lord. Under what provision of the Sharia law? Mm. Show me. Show us which part, which section of the Sharia uh, offences enactment allows you to do that. Mm. My Lord, there's no particular provision under the Sharia law itself which enables the Sharia court to consider the issue of lifting corporate will. However, as cited the case of one Kairani again, the essence of this case was its publication against the precepts of Islam. And in the case itself of one Kairani, the Sharia court did indeed consider the issue of lifting corporate will in that case itself. Hence, my Lord, although there's no particular provision for the authority of Sharia court, however, the Sharia court has the authority to impose liability on Samira, and the corporate will should not be used as a shield for this, just for Samira to escape her liability under the Sharia court itself. Furthermore, under, under, under what justification in that case did the court lift the corporate will? What justification? You said there's no specific... Isn't it? Harta Sepancharian. Yes, my lord. This is a claim this of Harta Harta Sepancharian. This is a criminal offence. Different thing. Mm. Yeah. My lord, in answering that, the respondent acknowledged that the facts of that case is, is different from the facts of our no, case. No, no, it's not different. It's as different as cheese from chalk. Mm -hmm. You're talking yes, about my private lord. law. You're talking about public law. You're talking about imposition of criminal sanctions. So my, yes, learned, my, brother's, my learned brother's question is targeted. That has got nothing to do with this case. So, Hartas Pancharyan and going to jail are two yeah. different things. You agree, Ms. Chan? <laughs> yes, my lord. Yeah, However, you don't go to jail over sex, Hartas Pancharyan, unless you murder the person no? for the Harta. <laughs> right? Yeah. So, the point is, what has that got to do with it? Mm. Huh. My lord, this respondent is trying to draw an illustration from the case of Juan Khairani. Although the facts are different on that, however, if I may refer the court to second list nine schedule of the federal constitution, it was stated that Shara court has jurisdiction to hear matters regarding the control and propagation of belief among persons professing the religion of Islam. And section 16 of SCOE falls within the jurisdiction of Shara court for this matter. Hence the issue of SPSB are once again merely assisting the Shara court to impose liability on Samira for offence of Section 16 SCOE. Moving yes, on, my, moving on, my lord. The respondents. I'm not, convinced. I'm not convinced, but I'll hear you. Yes. Moving on, my lord. The respondents submit that the corporate will between SPSV and Samira should be lifted. The opposing counsel have brought up the argument that. So corporate will can only be lifted in circumstances of fraud. However, the respondent rely on the case of Ong Leong Chiu and another, and Keller 2021, when that case, the federal court had cited the United Kingdom case of Press and Press 2013, stating that there are two principles for lifting corporate will. The first one is consumer principle, used by the court to ascertain the true facts of the situation. And the second principle, is evasion principle, where the court would leave the corporate will if there exists a legal right against the controller of the company, and the company is subsequently interposed to frustrate the said legal right. 
Legal right was defined by law assumption in the case press and press, including existing contractual liability, liability press or existing. Petrodel. Press and Petrodel, 2013, one weekly law, three weekly law reports, page one. I'm familiar with that case. Yes, my lord. Hence that was a family law case. That mm. was a family law case. The husband was trying to conceal his assets from the wife through by using a company. So, you know, matrimonial proceedings under the Law Reform Act are not strictly adversarial. They are inquisitorial. So the husband has to make full disclosure, full and frank disclosure. And when he didn't do that, then the court can lift the veil mm. under those circumstances. But Preston Petrodell is not a case of criminal liability. You're going to make send somebody to jail, as my as my learned brother uh, uh, mm -hmm. Richard Malanjum pointed out. You're talking about imposing mens rea on a on a, a corporate body. Yes, criminal intention. How do you do that? A lot as to the intention of Samira in this case. No, no, no. The company. Forget about Samira. Talk about the company. My lord, the respondents submit that the company SPSB is an alter ego of Samira itself. And yeah, who, who decided that? Who decided that? Has it been decided? My lord, it has not been decided clearly that mm. SPSB is an alter ego of Samira. But if I may cite the case of Yap Singh Hock and another and public prosecutor 1992, in that case, the test for alter ego is that where the person in charge is not speaking on behalf of the company, but speaking as the company itself. I have a passing familiarity with Yap Singh Hock because I argued it. <laughs> right? Mm. And in Yap Singh Hock, yeah, he was held liable for criminal breach of trust mm. for monies allegedly belonging to the company when he was himself the company. Am I right? Yes, my lord. Right. So here, you are saying that Samira uh, is the up, it's the it's the exact opposite argument. There, Yap Singh Hock was going to be punished for using the company's money, which was actually his own money. Mm. Right here, you are asking the company to be punished for something Samira did. <laughs> it's the other way around. Mm. Mm. What's your answer to that? Yap Singh Hock is distinguishable. Or is it not? If it is not, why not? My Lord, to clarify the respondent position, the respondents submit that we are not holding com the SPSP company liable for Samira action, but we are holding Samira for the company's action as she is speaking not on behalf of the company, but she's using the company to reach her own intention itself. But, but the company has been charged, is it not? Uh, my lord, if I may clarify, based on paragraph 5 of the supplement fact itself, it was stated that only Samira was charged and the company was nowhere mentioned in the charge. Okay. Yeah, but Samira is if I may refer liable for what the, the company did. paragraph 5.2 of supplement fact. I know, I know. Look, look, we know the facts, right? We know the facts. Don't have to remind us of the facts. It's Chan. My learned brother's question is, can the company be charged? Because you are imputing the, the, the more or less offense of the company to Samira. You are asking not... Samira to answer for mm. something the company did. Mm. And if they are two separate individuals, mm -hmm. you can't do that. Therefore, my lord, the respondents submit that the corporate will between SPSP and Samira should be lifted. As Samira is using as No, my lord, the respondents submit that the corporate will should be lifted to avoid an abuse of corporate personality. As Samira is trying to use the will to avoid the Shara court imposing liability on her for section 16 of SEOE. But under what provision of the law that you have to do that? Under the Companies Act? My lord, 
given that the substance of the charge itself is within shared court jurisdiction and SCOE, the issue of company are once again merely assisting the shared court in determining the liability of Samira. And the if issue tomorrow, of company- if, if tomorrow, if tomorrow a person is alleged to have used a company to, let us say, uh, buy property, which he is not entitled to have under Islamic law, because the title is not clear for some reason, the Sharia court can lift the veil of incorporation. That's your answer. Yes, my lord. So in other words, you can go into property law as well. You can go into criminal law, it can go into property law, it can go they into think. any section, <laughs> any area of the law, even where the principles of company law, which are administered exclusively, exclusively by the civil court. My Lord, this is because that we should avoid any abuse of corporate personality for anyone just to use the principle of separate legal entity. YP, your problem, you should have legislated for it, but you didn't. You are relying on the civil law in order to enforce uh, Sharia law. Can you do that? You are relying on civil law to enforce Sharia law. Can you do that? Ms. Chan. My Lord, my Lord, the respondents submit that we are not trying to use the civil law to enforce Sharia law, but it's because the appellant had particularly bring up the issue of civil law and trying to bring up the issue of corporate will to escape her liability. As clearly in the as clearly in the charge, right? Yeah, Mr. Chan, I mean it's apparent, it's apparent that uh, there, there's no case law on the issue that we're talking about. I presume that you are submitting to us, to the federal court now, to say that in the circumstances like this, where there's an offence against the principle of Islam and the Sharia court is exercised jurisdiction, and because that person is trying to use the company law to avoid liability, in that circumstances, Sharia court has the jurisdiction to, to lift the corporate bell. That is your submission, isn't it? Yes, my lord. Oh, okay, just say that... that, that, that uh, that the, <laughs> we, as the federal court, has to make a decision on that because within the last half an hour, you cannot cite any, any authority or whatever <laughs> section to us uh, uh, where that power comes from. So that is your submission, right? Uh, yes, my lord. Thank you. If the lord, if my, if my lord has no further question on the third issue, I'll move on to the fourth issue. Please. Moving on to the fourth issue. The respondents submit that the two restricting grounds under Section 7 of PPPA are constitutional, given that they're enacted by the parliament in the interest of public order. You see, if you read the judgment of the unanimous judgment of the nine justices bench in Alma Nudo, there is a passage which says, in the judgment of the chief justice, my learned brother, which says very clearly, that parliament cannot make any law it pleases, that the law must satisfy certain criteria. Correct? Does this law satisfy that criteria? My law and my lord, the respondents submit that the test that needs to be satisfied to see whether the restriction are valid, it is the proportionality test. There's three limbs. The, the test to satisfy- In addition to proportionality, you also have to satisfy the rule of law test. After Alma Nudo, you have to satisfy the rule of law test. My Lord, the respondents submit that the two restrictions, likely to alarm public opinion and likely to be prejudicial to public interest, are proportionate to the objective of Article 10 Cross 2 itself and PPPA itself, looking at the Hansard of PPPA, page 732, it was clearly stated that the PPPA are enacted in, with the authority of Article 10, Clause 2 to restrict any possible publication which could affect the public order, morality, or security of the Federation. Yes, but with the court still having the power to strike it down, is you know, the power that an overall uh, uh, jurisdiction to oversee whether it's within or outside. Is it not? It's like, let me stand. <laughs> Yes, my lord. However, the respondents submit on that 
the two ground public opinion and public interest are pith and substance, has the potential to affect directly or indirectly the public order of the space, and it should remain valid on that. As okay. stated by Mr. Pr as stated by Mr. President just now, in the case of Siwa Rasia Rasia, that public order was given the definition to construe widely, including the potential to disrupt the even tempo of community. And if something were to be deemed against the public opinion or against public interest, that means it is going against the social norm of the community and has the very likely potential to disrupt the public order of the state itself. You see, in Dharma Surya, in Dharma Surya, the accused, the detainee, beg your pardon, the detainee was detained because he was involved in the sale of stolen cars. Remember the facts of Dharma Surya. Mm -hmm. In those facts, on those facts, we held that it upset the even tempo of society because no person's car will be safe on the road if you have a ready market for stolen cars. There's a, there's a basis on which the public order is affected. Here, you're talking about a community which is practicing a particular religion and there's a publication which is being tested against the, the very values which are fundamental to our constitution, which is freedom of speech. And you say that you should gag this person because it is going to cause panic among uh, the persons uh, professing the religion of Islam. Is that what you're saying? Yes, my lord. The respondent... And that, is public order. and that doesn't come within the definition of public order. My lord, the respondents submit that in this case, the book is saying that gay is okay. And gay particularly is still not to be legalized in Malaysia itself. And the penal court has also given permission that unnatural sex between gay are to be deemed an offense for it. And hence, if this book were to propagate that such opinion are to be deemed okay, then it would, of course, disrupt the even tempo of the community, but the way is likely to do so. Wind up your submission, please. Much obliged, my lord. For this reason submitted, the respondents submit that the, on the third issue, the Shara court has jurisdiction to hear the matter stated in the charge. And on the fourth issue, the respondents submit that the two restricting grounds are proportionate to Article 10, Cross 2. This thank sums you. up the respondent's submission, and I thank the court for its time and indulgence. Rebuttal. Appellant. My lords, Sakina again on behalf of the appellants. My lords, we have two points to be submitted before the court today. First is regarding the first issue of law, and second is regarding the third issues of law. My lords, for the first point, we respectfully submit that the respondents have failed to address the contention that Section 16 is indeed having an open-ended design. And as my lords have also rightfully pointed out, that there will be Don't a Don't rely on our argument. You argue. Mm -hmm. Don't, whether we are right or wrong is not important. You tell us why. All right? Yes, my lords. Yeah, tell us. The Section 16 then will have a concurrent offence under the PPP, such as under the PPPA, as well as the Penal Code, which prohibits publication contrary to public law, uh, apologies, my lord, contrary to public order. And a book that is contrary to Islamic law will be then threatening public order as well. And as to quote from the respondents, it will be disturbing pub the even tempo of life. And thus, Section 16 is a redundant law with the federal law and also trapped under the preclusion clause as decided by the ratio in Ikiputra. My lords, for the second issue of law, we submit that the, my learned respondents had cited the case of Wine Kairani. My lords, we like to point out that the issue in that particular case was the subject matter of Harta Sepancharyan, which squarely falls but under- You see, if you, can, if you can lift a veil of incorporation, their point is this. If you can lift the veil of incorporation, for something in private law, like Harta Sapancharyan, why can't you lift it in public law to impose criminal liability? That is their argument. What is your answer to that? If My you Lord, can do it in one instance, you can do it in another instance. 
The only My difference Lord. is it's a different context. That's all. Wind up, wind up. My Lord, we respectfully submit that the act of publishing, uh, publishing itself was done by the company. And companies fall under the jurisdiction of the civil courts. And only the civil courts can administer the company's law as provided as the Company <laughs> Act 2006. And my Lord, also it has to be noted that the doctrine of piercing the corporate veil is essentially a common law doctrine, which only the civil courts apply and not the Sharia courts. Um, my Lord, that sums up my rebuttals. I thank the court for its time and indulgence, my Lord. Respondents rebuttal. Do you have a right of rebuttal? Yes, no. my Lord, I believe I do. Yes. Honourable members of the court, the respondent only has two sir rebuttals. Firstly, jurisdiction is granted to Sharia court to execute punishment, and Parliament has intended this so by way of the criminal criminal jurisdiction of Sharia Courts Act under Section Two. The punishment. You are repeating by... yourself. <laughs> I have never heard that repetition has enforced an argument. My Say Lord, something new. My Lord previously questioned on where is jurisdiction granted. So this is the act enacted. <laughs> However, the opposing counsel raises that the subject matter still can't be distinguished between publications. However, it is provided in the PPPA handset itself under for the printing presses and publication act. If I may read to the court, undang-undang ini bukan bertujuan untuk mengokong atau menghadkan kegiatan-kegiatan berkaitan dengan agama Islam. The purpose of the PPPA Act is to mengawal dengan lebih berkesan terhadap penerbitan yang tidak bermoral atau yang berpotensi menjejaskan kenteramaan awam atau keselamatan negara. Hence, it is clearly intended by Parliament that the PPPA Act comes on different grounds and does not seek to address the Islamic religion. Hence, with regards to my second sir rebuttal, the subject matter of this charge is against the precepts of Islam. The, hence, the Sharia court has the jurisdiction to hear matters with issue of the company as assistance is to impose liability as submitted by my co-counsel in the case of Wan Karani, that company matters are assisting matters when jurisdiction is conferred upon the Sharia courts. With that, I end my sir rebuttal. Thank you very much. Bailiff, can you take us to the <laughs> break, room, breaking, break room, please? The yes. court uh, stands adjourned. The honorable right. court is reserve judgment. We reserve right. judgment. <laughs> right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Now, thank you, honorable judges, to the holding room for deliberation. Thank you, and please be patient as we work on moving the judges to the deliberation rooms now.
Welcome back to the main room judges. We would now like to invite the judges to give their comments on the case. I invite my learned brother, Kun Richard Maranjun, to give his comments first. Thank you, uh, Sri Ram, and uh, my brother, Sri David. Uh, I must say that uh, after coming three years of sitting and doing something else, it was interesting to hear you all uh, submitting, and uh, it was a good afternoon for me at least, uh, uh, and hearing the two Sri Ram uh, bashing you guys, I managed to stand up to his bashing, Congratulations for that. Uh, myself and Nancy David were very mild, so at least not that bad. <laughs> anyway, uh, the standard I would say must be good. Uh, command of language, uh, good, and uh, uh, the law as well. Uh, except maybe that uh, in the future when you're practicing law, it'd be good uh, to know as wide as possible on the subject. Yeah? So whenever the judges then throw in a case, you'll be familiar with it instead of uh, just guessing uh, the answer. So that I think you should avoid uh, or try to overcome in the future. And uh, secondly is that uh, you, I think most of you got dis distracted from answering the questions, uh, the, the, the point that you're submitting by the questions, but you should stick to it, you know, you should stick to your rail, uh, to, your, to your road, instead of, even though you get distracted, but uh, don't get uh, flooded, uh, no? uh, flooded easily on that. Don't, don't get distracted. So that's it. So congratulations again to all of you. And uh, the result, I think, will be announced later. Uh, that's my comment. Thank you, Sri. Could I invite my brother, Sri David Wong, to... Uh, thank you, the, the Sri. Um, Sri, thank you for the organizer inviting me. Um, of course, uh, thoroughly enjoyed like uh, Dun says especially um, uh, I say here I have not had the chance to sit with uh, Dadok Sri Papa Sri Ram ever on the Court of Appeal and uh, of course I've appeared before him uh, several times and even before the start of the session I told him that I'm glad I'm not appearing before him and um, the way you guys have handled the way he distracted you uh, is, is really fantastic um, this is this is as real as you can get. All right, this is as real as you can get. Uh, that's how the Dr. Sri handles the court. That's how Tun um, hear cases. And and um, the all four of you uh, came through with flying colors. I, I was impressed that we you were not put off by the way uh, we asked the question. Um, you you try to stick to the to the uh, to the your 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 plan of action. Um, of course the. On the respondent side, that you 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 felt you had some difficult question when he kept asking you, what is your uh, foundation was saying that you can lift the corporate the Sharia court can lift the corporate bell, you know. Uh, but I, I think at the end I I try to help out to to say that look, we don't have any. Maybe you can sort of make little concession when when you're being badgered, without uh, dismantling your own case, just throwing the thing back to the federal court. It's for this court to decide that. You know uh, that whether Sharia court has a jurisdiction. Um, apart from that, um, I thoroughly enjoyed. Uh, I, uh, I uh, my what Tun said about prep, uh, knowing your cases, preparing cases. Uh, I agree hundred percent. That looks really. I give back. Hand the chair back Thank to you. you. Thank you very much. Each and every one of you is a winner. And let us assure you that the difference in uh, the marks you receive. Marginal, marginal, habits difference. And I want to congratulate all of you. I'm a regular on this show, so I know more or less what happens. <clears throat> I want to thank the university and of course the foundation for inviting all of us and for remembering the dinosaurs who served the judiciary all those years <laughs> ago. And we want to I want to uh, congratulate each and every one of you for being able to meet the arguments which we were putting to you, encountering them. All of you did very well. Uh, I agree with my learned brother, mm. uh, Richard. 
that you have to read much wider than what you read you have read for the for the case because sometimes questions would be asked outside the range you have to meet them so you have to read a little bit outside your immediate uh, brief memorial otherwise i offer you my congratulations and we look forward to welcoming you to the bar, Malaysian bar in due course congratulations thank you very much dean organizers thank you thank you dean thank us. you thank you and uh, could you then now take us to the break room piece so that we can have man, our man room, conference room man room i think um, before we proceed to the closing ceremony, I would like to invite everyone for a quick photo taking session first. Mm -mm. So incidentally, bailiff, it's council, not councils. Even yeah. if there are five lawyers, it's council. Okay? All right, I'll take note of that. Thank you very much. Dr. That's a decision by the Indian Supreme Court. Mm. <laughs> um, if everyone is prepared, I will take screenshots on the count of three. One... Two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. I'll move you to the breakout rooms now. Thank you. Thank you, Jaja. Mm -hmm. Team meeting.